God, prepare our hearts right now to hear from your word. Help us to see just what a sacred honor this is to come into your presence and hear the words from your lips. Help us, God, take away the distractions, remove the demonic from this room, disruptions, that we can truly see you in your glory tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If tonight, um, let's just say God said, you can treat me like a genie tonight. And I'll give you three wishes. Really think in your mind right now, what would you ask for? Try to narrow it down to the three things that you would ask for tonight. Got that in your head? You know, this, this morning's reading, we, uh, re we read Exodus 32 through 34. I want to share some thoughts from that today. Because in Exodus 33, verse 18, Moses says this. He goes, please show me your glory. This is what Moses asked for. He comes before God and he says, please show me your glory. And I just want to ask, did that make your list tonight? Where you think, God, if I could have anything, could I see you in your glory tonight? I want this. Did that make your list? Or if you could say, God, okay, if I could have anything, would you be like Moses and say, God, I, I'm just, I'm tired of just life and, and just going through the motions and going to work and talking to humans. Is there a way that I could actually see you? Like, is that the desire of your heart? Tonight, did you, did you come here thinking, gosh, tonight I might get to see his glory, and I want that. You see, in this passage in Exodus 33, that's, you know, right after, in, in chapter 32 is when Moses is coming off of the mountain after meeting with God for 40 days on a mountaintop. He comes down and he sees everyone worshiping these golden calves and singing and celebrating all this noise. And, and uh, God says, you know, he says to Moses, you know what, I'm just going to wipe them out. And I'll start all over with you. Look at what those people are doing. And, uh, and then in chapter 33, in the beginning, it says, I'm just going to make it a habit of when I read the Word of God to come over here so you know that, okay, this is different, sacred. He's about to read from God's Word. That something in your heart should shift from, oh, Francis is sharing some thoughts. He's talking about a genie, whatever. And then he comes over here. Okay, this is coming from God. Exodus 33, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, 
depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So in this passage, God is telling the people, he goes, look, you can go. You can go to the promised land now. Okay? I'll forgive you of what you did there, you know, worshiping these golden calves. He goes, I'll let you go and I'll send an angel before you to give you your best life. This is the promised land. This is everything you ever hoped for. You can have it, and you're, we're gonna, I'll even send an angel to drive out all of your enemies. So you have peace in this land, you and your families, the best land you've ever seen. It's yours. But he goes, but I'm not going with you. He goes, because if I go with you, he goes, I'll probably end up annihilating you. I'll probably just kill you all. Because earlier he had told Moses, I, I'm just going to kill them. I'm just going to kill them. Look at them. I'm going to kill them. This is the God that we came to commune with tonight. And I know some of you have taken philosophy class or you've talked to some of your friends who think they're philosophers and with these deep thoughts going, well, if God is a loving God, could he really judge and punish How could a loving God punish? Well, first of all, God says he's a loving God. And remember, God actually flooded the earth and killed everyone in it. So, God says he is love, and God killed everyone on earth. So, either he's mixed up, or you are. And your buddies are, and your philosophy teacher is. God says, I'm loving, but I'm also a God of wrath. And so here, when he says, look, I, I'm not going to go with you, because if I go with you, I might just kill you. And, and, and in fact, you got to remember the context. When God saw them, when, when Mo Moses goes down and he sees people worshiping this calf, You've got to remember in, in chapter 32 what God says. Verse 25 of chapter 32. When Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor and the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. A lot of times we tell stories from the Bible and we'll skip certain parts. This is one of the parts your Sunday school teacher probably skipped. And your pastor probably skipped because that just seems crazy to us. Wait, you had people go back and forth stabbing, killing people because of the sin? Because of their rebellion? 
This is the God that we came to worship tonight that says, I'm a holy God and I deserve to be worshiped in a way that's pure. He's a God of wrath. So when God tells these people, look, I can't go with you because I'll end up killing you all. But you can go. Go to your promised land. And then Moses says in verse 15 of chapter 33. He said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the group, you know, on the, from the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please, Show me your glory. And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So the people are mourning because God says, I'm not going with you. And Moses says, look, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. I don't care that it's the best land. I don't care that it's everything we dreamed of. He goes, what I dream of is you, God. I dream of your presence with me. This, I, I can't live without your presence. I'll stay here in the desert. I'll stay in the wilderness. I'll stay wherever, but I have to have you with me. I can't go to the promised land without you. God says, okay, I'll go with you. And Moses goes, please show me your glory. Is that your heart posture right now in life? Where you go, I don't care about all this other stuff. God, don't give me a perfect marriage. Don't, don't give me children. I don't care. Don't just get, make me successful. Don't just give me my health back. I, that's great. Sure, I'll take that. But I want your presence. And if your presence isn't here, I don't want to go there. And I want to see your glory. These Friday nights, I was praying. I go, God... I don't care if three people show up tonight. Can I see your glory? Please, show me your glory. Please, show me your glory. He's telling God, oh God, I've been serving you, following you for 40 years now. And I haven't, I haven't seen some of these things I've read about in this book. If I could have anything tonight, show me your glory. I just want to see you. I just want to, I just want, there's so many moments in scripture. I've been reading through the Bible. In fact, that this week, just this week, in like three days, I read half of the Bible. And I'm just looking at, at the, these patterns where, where it's like, you know, 
God tells Moses, Here, here's how I want you to set up the tabernacle. That's what he was doing for 40 days on the mountain, showing him how to do it. And then the, the people actually do everything that he says, and they set up the tabernacle. And then the end of Exodus is the glory comes and fills the tabernacle. Now, as we're reading today in 2 Chronicles, then, then Solomon is building the temple of God. And God gives him very specific instructions. Do this, do this. All the people work together, do everything so reverently. And again, they get it all done. They listen to the Lord. They, they make the sacrifices. And oh, the glory of God shows up. And I'm just praying to the Lord. I'm going, God, forgive me. I have not considered these gatherings as holy as I should. I've not been so careful to, to revere your word and your, the bread and the cup and to come here seeking your glory. Sometimes, man, when I was a pastor, I used to love it when the room was just packed, filled with people, overflowing, and I'd, I'd be frustrated if I saw empty seats. I'd be frustrated if, oh no, the offering was less than last week, or the, you know, what, whatever. Just all these other things that brought me excitement. Yeah, we filled up five services. There wasn't room. There, people are sitting everywhere. Nothing wrong with that. But was I really seeking the presence of God? Was I really wanting to see his glory? Was my hope the thought of communing with him, almighty God, and him revealing himself in a way that he'd never revealed to me? You got to understand, Moses saw God in a burning bush in chapter 3. And God speaks to him. You got to remember, God spoke to Moses and then he, he led the people. God used him to cast all these plagues onto the Egyptians and Pharaoh. And then God used him to, to split the Red Sea and lead you know all of his people out. Moses... You know, in, in chapter 19, walks up a mountain that's on fire to be with God. And then Moses is in the presence of God on a mountaintop for 40 days. After all of that experience with God, he goes, now, show me your glory. Most of us would be like, gosh, I've never even seen the burning bush. I've never, you know, the thought of being on a mountaintop that's on fire with God. And he's asking for more. He's like, I, I want to see you in all of your glory. And God says, I can't do it. You can't see my face and live. No man can see my face and live. But he says, Moses, here's what I'll do for you. There's going to be this rock, and I'm going to let you hide yourself in it, and I'll pass by, and you'll get to see some of my glory. And I'll speak my name to you. And Moses is like, okay. How badly do you want to be in the presence of God and to see his glory? If this is not a huge desire in your heart, that's a big problem. Because this entire book is about God dwelling with man the hope of what Justin was was talking about that that he, he came and he died so that he could bring us to God it, it starts in the book of Genesis with God creating man in his own image and they're walking in the garden together 
This is what you know, God created humans to do and to be, is people who are in his presence and walking with him. It was the perfect environment. I'm in the garden with God. And then sin separates us. And then you get all the way, you know, the, you know, God promises a deliverer to Adam and Eve. He promises his Messiah and he comes and that's what we celebrated here. And then you get all the way to the book of Revelation and in the final eternal state, you know, the biggest blessing it says, and God will be with them in that city. He's going to dwell with us. And we won't need lights. We don't need the sun. It's just a new existence where it's like, we're going to be walking with God again. Just the way he intended. And so right now is that time where we long like Moses. And he's going, God, I I want that. I want that. I want that. The New Testament says we groan. Creation should be groaning for this going, I want the new body, I want the new existence, I want to be with God, I want to see his glory. We will have so many problems in the church if our greatest desire is not to see his glory. Because then everyone comes for a different reason, and go, oh, I came because I thought there was going to be a full band with drums, not just a little box thing. I thought there was going to be a killer, you know, kids ministry, you know, not just two people. I, I thought I didn't, I, I, I thought there'd be more, you know, girls. I thought there'd be more whatever. I, I Just right before this, I was at the YMCA because my son was playing basketball right next door. And I invited a guy to come tonight. And he goes, are there going to be snacks? I forget it. You know, it's just the, no, it's just, you know, trying to get them to think about, you know, what this is about. But church has become about so many different things for so many different people. And we've lost that heart that just says, I want to commune with the God of glory. Please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Please show us your glory. I read about it. They did these things and they revered him. And then you showed him your glory. In Leviticus 9... In Leviticus 9, verse 6, Moses said, This is a thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. This is the thing that God has, has commanded you to do. This is the thing he commanded you to do, so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. So he tells the people, look, I'm going to tell you what we need to do because I want the glory of God to appear. And so a few verses later, they do all of that stuff. And then in verse 23 of chapter 9, it says, And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Don't you want to put that on your list of the three things you'd wish for? God, can we do this right in a way that honors you and is so reverent that we could see your glory? Could we one day 
as an entire church. Truly mean it from our heart. Please show us your glory tonight. I was praying this week. I go, Lord, what are churches known for in America? Usually they're known for their pastor. How well they speak. Or some churches are known for their music. How the great songs they write the atmosphere they create. Some are known for a couple other things. I was like, what if we were known as a group of people? Like we weren't known for who's on stage. We were known for people who hunger for the glory of God. What if every week all of us came in with a heart that's prepared? You know, you don't come in and, 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 and we warm you up with a few songs and a call to worship. And then, you know, and then Justin warms you up a little bit more with a, you know, talk about communion. And then, okay, now I'm ready to worship. But what if you're a person that's just hungry for the glory of God? And go, God, could it be tonight? Could it be tonight? You know, in the Old Testament, when they'd go up to the temple, they would read the Psalms of Ascents. They would, they would take a step and read a psalm, take another step up and read a psalm. There were the exact number or the right amount of the big steps to where they would read so that when they came into the presence of God, they're like, okay, I'm going to the temple now. I'm ready. I'm ready. God, show me your glory. And I get it. We're not in Old Testament times. And, but I want you to think about something. Because they were so meticulous in the Old Testament. So reverent in the Old Testament. Now that Jesus has come, does God want us to be less reverent? When you read the book of Hebrews, does it seem like, wow, it was really extreme back then. Now let's take it easy. The book of Hebrews was about, that was intense, but we're at another level here. Hebrews 12 talks about, okay, they, they knew him as this whirlwind, this tempest, this fire. And then he takes it up a notch, and at the end he goes, so therefore, let's worship him with reverence and awe because our God is a consuming fire. In light of all this, there should be another level. Because I think we know in the Old Testament, you know, when you've got the robes, you've got the sacrifices, you have someone going in to the Holy of Holies and he might die as he enters into the presence of God. That's intense. Or someone offers some fire that isn't right. They're struck dead. That's intense. But somehow we feel like New Testament, we don't have to be that reverent anymore. And I'm looking at the New Testament now and going, wow, God, you are a consuming fire. Forgive me for being casual about your presence. Forgive me for making church about so many things and trying to please everyone to where now we just go for ourselves and what we want to get out of it versus saying, God, I've come to worship you and I would love to see your glory. I want your presence I'm going to have Lisa come up and read again. Um, okay. 
She's going to read Exodus 33 and 34, and then we'll worship him. But this is our time to tremble at God's word. You've heard a lot of things all week long, but this is the word of God now. And so as almighty God in heaven looks down on us and sees every person's heart, let's show him a people who revere his word. And God, give us clarity of mind right now so that we can listen. You said, he who has ears, let him hear. Help us be a congregation of people who love to hear your word. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious 
and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation, And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, And you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month Abib. For in the month Abib you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep. The firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest, you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at your year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. You shall not 
offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we know from your word that you are present with us in this room. If your presence is in here, we don't want to be here. You're always with Moses. Yet he wanted to see more of you. Please show us your glory tonight. Please show us your glory. We're supposed to have greater revelation of you. According to your word, In 2 Corinthians 3, you say the ministry of the Spirit should far exceed the glory that Moses experienced. So forgive us, God, for doubting your word and not wanting your glory. Fix our hearts tonight. Give us faith and desire as we worship you that we might see your glory. In Jesus' name. 